Welcome to this short lecture about my paper, Housing Supply Absorption Rate Equation. Cameron Murray is my name and I'm a research fellow in the Henry Halloran Trust at the University of Sydney. The absorption rate is the question at issue here, and that is how quickly new housing is supplied to the market by private landowners. So the motivating puzzle I have is, you are a large de housing developer the plot of land on the fringes of a major city with no planning constraints. How quickly should you sell these lots to supply them to the housing market? Housing academics actually do not have a good answer for this question. Housing developers, from my experience working in the industry, have rules of thumb about how quickly to sell and when to put prices up or when to put them down. Yet despite this limited knowledge about what really affects the rate of new housing supply, Radical policy changes are being considered in cities across the world to entice faster supply from landowners. Puzzling because we don't really know what factors affect this rate per period of time. Typically what housing academics and researchers do is they use a static model of housing supply. Where the equilibrium is solved for independent supply and demand curves, uh, where if you consider it as a, as a graphical representation as we do here, you've got a, a stock of dwellings in a city centre and a, a price per dwelling. Um, and that's what equilibriates. Okay, so you have a price level and a stock quantity that reaches an e equilibrium because it's assumed that that supply curve is related to rising input costs of development. So you can imagine that in practice being when you've used up all the flat, easily accessible land on a, in a city region that the next housing has to be supplied on a slopey inaccessible one and the cost for putting a home on a slope the driveway access the roads etc the plumbing everything is slightly more expensive and that's why the supply curve slopes upwards with price level so this model is actually not too bad at capturing stylized facts about the structure of cities especially when it allows, it's allowed to equilibrate across dimensions like distance to the center of the agglomeration. <coughs> if the equilibrium result in those situations is that you have high density and high prices in the city, and because of accessibility, and because the demand curve slopes down with distance, you get lower prices and lower density heading away from the city. So it makes sort of sense in that regard, but it fails to consider a couple of things. First, new housing supply is not the same as for example the supply of fruit and vegetables or uh, newly built cars or electronic gadgets um, land is an asset and a house is an asset so prior to developing you own a site that is an asset that earns a rate of return and when you develop that site and you sell it off you give up that rate of return so a more complete model has to consider that the production of housing is not a market clearing function like we get after a harvest of wheat or bananas where the price equilibriates to clear the market. It's, an actu it's a balance sheet allocation problem of how quickly do I develop to optimize the rate of growth in my balance sheet because I'm currently on the balance sheet is land and when I develop it's gonna be cash because I'm gonna sell that to somebody else. The second part that this model has problems with is there's no uh, way to get from one equilibrium to another and it's not obvious how or why that, that can happen. So if you look at this chart here, uh, look at the S L equals 1. So that L equals 1 means there's a small amount of land. L is 1 instead of 2 on the, the lower supply curve and D1 is that demand curve. So point A is the sort of first equilibrium. Um, so if you release more land for development, this model would make you assume, well, the supply curve's gone down. So you go from SL1 to SL2, and the equilibrium, therefore, is, is B instead of A. So the question is, how do you get to B? How do you add new dwellings at such a rate that um, the price falls? Um, is that something that happens? We typically know when prices are falling, housing supply comes down. So you've got a few things there. Um, just to finish off, if demand then shifts to D2 in this model, you're up at point C now on that other supply curve. However, in the reverse direction, when 
demand falls, you get that vertical part of the supply line. And the, the assumption there is that, well, once houses are built and demand falls, well, you've got these sunk costs, you're going to minimize your losses on your existing dwellings and you're going to decrease the rent and price. So that's sort of static model. It should sound fairly familiar to you if you've thought about housing supply or studied it much in any, any way. But I propose uh, a dynamic approach. And this has sort of three ingredients that I think are missing from the static model. Okay, the first is it considers the balance sheet of landowners who can earn returns prior to development from their land. Okay, uh, because in the static model, any land with development potential is already developed by assumption because we're already in equilibrium. There's no time, we're at that period. So um, we break open the time, we allow this balance sheet, so we've got periods before land is developed where land is owned, able to be developed, but it's earning a return. We also consider an own output effect of new sales on dwelling price growth. And basically the idea there is that the market is, is finite. You can't just get from one point to another as quickly as possible. The buyers don't equilibrate and go, oh, well, I know that there'll be a shortage in the future, therefore I'll pay the price now. Okay, we just take the immediate information and we we act on that and we can change our decisions in future periods. So what I mean by this own output effect, think about any asset market, a share market, stock market. Uh, there's a demand schedule and a supply schedule as people put bids at the market to sell. Now, if you try and sell all at the same time and sell a lot of the shares of one company, you will have a price effect. Even though fundamentally nothing's really changed about the earnings or income of the company, the very fact you're trying to sell more than someone's trying to buy is going to affect the price. Even if you know, you're relatively small, it's a real effect. That's why prices vary a lot in asset markets day to day. So we consider this. Um, you can also think about this as your uh, this own price effect as there's a secondary market in dwellings. So there's the existing stock of dwellings that buy and sell all the time and you're just adding a little bit to the side, a little bit of extra on the supply side. Okay, And so um, you can think about that as there's an independent market and there's this new market, this existing market and new market. And third, what the way we solve the model is that there's a dynamic equilibrium. Okay, and the difference between the dynamic and the static equilibrium is the dynamic equilibrium is a point, it occurs only at a point in time. And at that point in time, it's the rate of new dwelling sales or production that maximizes the value of the sequence of sales of new dwellings uh, that occurs. So, over time. So, you can think of this as saying, well, is selling three dwellings a month and three dwellings next month and three the following and three the subsequent month is that sequence given I know uh, what the price growth is and I know how sensitive the market is for me going up and selling five or six per month is that sequence of three per month better than a sequence of six per month where I double the rate per period okay so that's what we mean by dynamic equilibrium and you can sort of begin to see that um, how many dwellings you can build is not going to affect that optimal rate. So that rate is going to be optimized independently of how dense, for example, you can develop your, your property. So let's have a think about the balance sheet return. So let's consider prior to development, I'm the landowner from our motivating example and uh, I can develop as many plots of land as I want. Prior to development, what am I earning? Well, I'm earning R dot T. What do I mean by R dot T? Well, that's the rate of change of the value of my lot, my large lot that I can subdivide. Its value is not static. And if it goes up, I make money, and that's a return as good as any other profits I can get in the economy. Also, I lose R tau T, R T tau, which is the tax rate on undeveloped land on its value. So if there's a tax on holding land, then I have to pay that each period, but my land goes up. And so the net of that is the return I make over a period. Well, here we're looking at instantaneous rates, so it's the rate I, uh, my, my balance sheet increases. Now, after development, when I've sold a piece of land, I 
what I do is I exchange land for cash. The buyer gives me cash, I give them land, and I, that cash sits on my balance sheet as well. And that cash, we just for now assume earns I, the interest rate. Okay, so you can see how this setup is, is quite different to the normal sort of production setup in, in economics. We've got an asset allocation decision going on here where we're allocating cash and land in our balance sheet when we, when we develop and sell. You might also notice I've missed the cost of building housing. And that's because for now, and you can read the paper that I'll link to at the end and in the description, uh, we don't need to know how much it costs because what you can do is you can borrow to construct and then repay when you've built and the interest cost on the time of doing that is just a lump sum. Okay, so we're just netting out um, the development cost here. All right, so the main part of the return to owning land prior to development is, is R.T, which is the rate of change of land value, R meaning the rent to land. And the, that obviously includes the change in price of a dwelling because the land is the residual of the dwelling price minus the construction cost. But it also includes a second component, which is the change to the optimal density of land. So when the price is higher for dwellings, you can build, you can sell smaller plots of land, or you can build more dwellings per unit of land. These are the same equivalent thing. And so you get this extra bit of value gain. You don't just get the price growth, you get the change in the density as well. So there's, there's a reason uh, that large companies invest in land banking and, and, and sites with very long-term development potential because they make returns while they're undeveloped. So we can try and visualize this, okay? So this graph is the quantity of dwellings, dwelling lots per site. So it's the density on the x-axis and it's the real dwelling price on the y-axis. And it's got a rising marginal cost of density, which is true in the housing market. It costs more per dwelling to build a high rise than a mid rise. It costs more per dwelling to build a mid rise and a low rise, it costs more per dwelling or per area of dwelling to build a low rise um, you know, townhouse or a walk up apartment than it does to build a detached house. So this is uncontroversial. Okay, it's also assumed in the static model. Okay, so if we're at a point in time where the price is PT and the optimal the optimal density is DT, okay, so this dashed line where price equals marginal cost maximizes the residual which is this orange shaded area here, okay, at time t. Now we've got a price change. So the new price, PT plus one, is up here. The optimal density at this higher price is now over here at DT plus one. And our residual land value has gone from this orange square surrounded by the dotted line. We've added A, which is the price effect alone, so the previous density and the change in price, okay. We've also added B, this area here, and subtracted C here, okay, because we've got rising costs. And B is always bigger than C. I'm not going to prove it, but it's true. And therefore, the price rise when density can vary is more than what it, the, the change in value of land in response to a price change in dwellings is more if density can vary. If density is fixed here at DT, all you do is you get A, density can vary, you get A plus B minus C, which is a positive number. Okay, so the way I sort of capture this in the model is I say, well, rate of change of land price R dot T is omega P dot T. Okay, so omega captures the slope of this curve. So when omega is one, it means the density is fixed, okay? It means that essentially this marginal cost curve kinks vertically here and it's never optimal to increase the density. So you, that's a way to capture a density constraint. Uh, when omega is more than one, that flattens those cost curves and when prices rise, you vary density much more, okay? So what we've got now is that, well, land prices rise more than house prices. Okay. So that's the uh, what you earn from waiting. Okay.
Now, let's factor in the next part to our, our new dynamic model of the absorption rate. We account for own output effects on prices. So in our dynamic model, these occur via the effect on the rate of change of price rather than the price level. So if we scale up our previous result here, okay, RT as a R dot T as a function of its current price, what we can do is we can account for D dot T, the demand change, okay, but QT is how much we supplied, what our rate of supply was that period. So DT minus AQT is this own output effect on the rate of change. So what that term in brackets there is the net um, price growth accounting for our own output, yeah? So that's how we do it. So um, remember we still get the omega, the scaled up gains to the price growth, um, and we get this price growth being a net effect of our own output. Okay. So this A term, this is how sensitive the price growth is to our own output. We can think of that as the thinness of the market. So how many buyers on the, on the other side, how sensitive those buyers are to the price. So it's sort of, um, if you think about asset trading markets again, when the, price, when the price varies a lot when you sell a few, when you're trying to sell out of your shares or your stocks, okay, um, that would be a, a, a high A. Yeah? But if you can sell a lot and not have a large price effect, you've got a low A. That's, so that's very much borrowing from the asset market type view. So what is the equilibrium in this dynamic approach? Well, the dynamic equilibrium um, sort of equates, it equalizes that you're indifferent to selling a certain rate per period today as you are tomorrow. So it equalizes that, so you're indifferent. So you can't increase the value of your sequence of sales by shifting a sale from today into tomorrow, okay? Or from tomorrow into today, okay? So you've equalized across that um, dynamic margin, okay? Uh, my son's just texting me, and now there's a car. Stop texting. Welcome to COVID work. So that's how you equalize in a dynamic equilibrium here. Yeah. Okay. So how this looks in practice is this sort of value equation that we're going to maximize with respect to the rate per period QT. So if we sell QT now, okay, we change our balance sheet by the value of the Q times the value of the land, RT, and that goes up by the interest rate that we get now because we own cash instead of land and tau the, the rate of tax we're avoiding by owning cash instead of land. Okay. So that's the gain to selling today QT amounts of land, QT lots. If we sell QT lots later, the gain over this same sort of arbitrary period that, that you use is the price gain, so the DT minus the AQT, the net price gain, times the value, times the omega, which is the density scaling factor, times QT. Okay, so if we hold QT instead, we're making the value gain, which is a function of this demand and our own price output that we sold this year because QT we're selling this period and next period. And we end up with this gain, this economic return. So the equilibrium is where return to developing units today is equal to developing them later. Okay, and so the margin of substitution between sales is equalized. So that's what I was saying before about um, optimizing dynamically. We solve that previous equation for Q, which is the rate per period. It's a rate, instantaneous rate, um, and this is what we end up with. Okay, the absorption rate, the optimal QT star, which is the rate of new housing supply. We get one on two A. So that means that the, the thinner the market, A, the fewer we sell. Okay, and we see that because in small towns with large subdivisions, uh, the market's very thin. There's not a lot of turnover there. So even though the subdivision is large, uh, they sell very few. 
okay? Because they can't just sell them all. The market's very thin. Okay, so it's, it's inversely related to the thinness of the market. It's positively related, related to demand growth, D dot T, and that is perfectly in keeping with what you'd expect um, if you look at any house price cycle when demand's rising or when price is rising, new housing's being supplied. Everyone sells into a rising market. That is what is optimal under these conditions. It's also positively related, and this is the somewhat more interesting result here, to the interest rate. Why would that be? That's because when you own land instead of selling it and getting an alternative return, um, if that alternative return is lower, the interest rate is lower, you can be more patient with selling land because holding it, you know, the alternative is not very good, so you hold for longer. The cost of holding it is lower, is the best way to put that. And that's the same with tau, the tax rate on the value of land. That's well established to act basically in the same way as the interest rate. Um, the higher the tax rate on holding land, the higher the cost to delay. So that's how, that's how you'd understand that. And the absorption rate is also inversely related to omega. Now, what does that mean? Omega captures, remember, the, um, the ease of building to higher density. So, so it goes from one and it gets higher. So when omega is one, essentially, it cancels out of this equation. That means that the density any landowner can build is fixed at the current optimal amount. That means when price goes up, they only get that A square from our previous diagram. But if A, if omega is um, five, it means that uh, if prices change a little, you'll increase density quite a lot because it's quite efficient for you to increase density. But that actually reduces the rate at which you supply the new dwellings. That's because that return to density is a payoff from delaying. It increases the value from delaying rather than building today. So that's how you should understand the dynamic equilibrium that we get for the absorption rate. This is what it looks like graphically, and I, d I don't think it's helpful, but you, know, you, you can take a look. Uh, I'm just going to go back. This effect of omega is quite different from what you get in the optimal density static model. If you constrict density in the static model, um, you uh, restrict supply. Now, supply is the stock, remember, it's not the rate per period, so it's different conceptually. So what we're, what we're looking at here is this path, this path of housing supply. And when you look at the path over time, that density con control can actually accelerate the development within that density controlled area. Now, this effect is pretty well established in all dynamic models of housing supply and even in the 80s uh, in the American Economic Review there was a paper that warned against restricting density in certain areas compared to other areas because house, housing supply will be faster in these areas. These will develop faster than those unconstrained areas because the return to weighting in the constrained area is lower. Where it's unconstrained, weighting gives you a better payoff. So let's kind of wrap this up with a comparison of the two approaches to housing supply and what parameters and what factors affect the equilibrium. So if we're thinking the static density model, which um, the dwelling price has a large effect. The higher the dwellings, the bigger the stock. Okay? But in the dynamic model that we just saw, the price level was not in there. Because the price level when you're comparing balance sheet washes out. Okay? You get it when you've sold it. You get the same price as cash as what you had as land. Okay? So the price level doesn't really matter. It's all about the returns, the, the changes that matter. So that means the growth in demand has no effect on the static density. You're either at the static equilibrium. If you've got a growth in demand, you're basically at a new static equilibrium. That rate, you, know, you can interpret it as being related to the speed of new supply, but it's not really in the model. Whereas in the dynamic model, the rate of demand is doing most of the work in determining the optimal absorption rate. The slope of the demand curve is negatively related to housing supply in both models, but in the dynamic one, it's more of um, the slope of the demand for buying, not the slope of demand for occupying houses. And if you look at the paper in the description, you'll see I consider that 
um, alternative scenario where rather than developing housing and, and selling, you develop and hold. And what you get is rents as a return, yeah? Rather than interest because you you haven't swapped the land for cash, you've swapped land and cash for a house and then you get, get rental returns. The per dwelling development cost doesn't really have an effect on the dynamic rate of supply. Uh, it's sort of embedded in the slope, this diseconomies of density idea. Um, but the effect of diseconomies of density is the opposite of what, you'd effect, of what you'd expect. So in the dynamic model, if it's more difficult to build more dense, or it's more costly to build more dense dwellings, you get faster supply. Whereas in the static model, if it's uh, more difficult to get, or more costly to build high density, you get lower density. And remember, density and supply are the same if you have a static model. The sum of the areas times the density is the stock. Developable area, there's no developable area in the dynamic model. Okay. Uh, in the static model, there is. I think that's quite reasonable because as prices change, uh, locations that were uneconom uneconomical for housing become economical. And so um, the developable land area is, is also a function of price and it's a function of you know, various path dependent investments made in each region. Um, last couple taxes on land value have no effect in the static model but in the dynamic model they do they certainly accelerate land development especially land development where landowners sell upon development and the interest rate is the the very interesting one and i think quite an insight into the long run observed trend of slower new housing investment in general now uh, the interest rate in the static model is negatively related, so high interest rates decrease supply. And that's because in the static model, you're borrowing to fund development costs. Because in the dynamic model, okay, the interest rate effect is, is having the effect of the, the, the gains or the cost to delaying versus going like developing today. So that's how the interest rate has an effect in the dynamic model. So you can see it's quite different. The, um, the parameter effects you get in these two different approaches to housing supply which should be, you know, should be of some sort of uh, interest to the many, many policymakers and many, many politicians and many, many pundits who talk about what we should do to fix housing supply. Okay, it's not operating the way you think. And I would further add, which is not really the focus of this paper, that uh, in Australia in particular, housing supply has been very responsive to population growth and demand growth. We've had record population growth. We had record housing construction. Um, we have more dwellings per person than we've had in the history of the country. So, uh, you know, I don't think uh, housing supply has a large effect on price. And we know because look at this. Housing is an asset. It has a value. It earns a return. It's valued like any other asset. So if the rent is the same, the price can still double if the prevailing interest rate in the economy falls by half. That's totally logical and it's going to have to happen. Now in the process of that adjustment, the dynamic model is going to explain how we get there. Okay, Because the prices will go like this and the dynamic model will see supplies respond to those dynamic uh, resulting uh, price effects from things like structurally lower interest rates and monetary policy. So let's wrap this up. Is it time to reconsider the economics of housing supply? I say yes. Static optimal density models conflict with the results of dynamic models. Now that's just really, really important because the logic of this dynamic model, I would say is even more economically grounded than this, the static model. Uh, so that should give us pause. We we should really think about if we want to change how private landowners supply dwellings what we have to do is think about increasing the cost to delaying housing supply we've got to uh, capitalize on this intertemporal margin to make developing later more costly than developing today and that's how you can manipulate the private market to deliver more housing supply Thanks for listening. I'm going to put a link to my paper in the comments and uh, I'll see you with my next video.